Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Pietro Perona uh, from Caltech and from Amazon Web Services. And today we'll talk about phase synthesis for an experimental approach to measuring algorithmic bias. And so what's the role of synthesis of humans for measuring algorithmic bias? <clears throat> so let me start with um, a very quick motivation. So we all work in AI and we think that AI is going to be very helpful for our daily life and for improving human condition, for saving the environment, for making life more enjoyable in general. However, there is concern in society um, uh, about whether algorithms are going to be as biased uh, and unfair as humans are. And so if you read the newspapers, this concern is pretty evident. You're sent to prison by a software program's secret algorithm. We teach AI systems everything, including our biases. Facial recognition is accurate if you're a white guy. And here is AOC calling out the vicious circle of white men building biased face AI. So whether or not you agree with individual claims, there is clearly something that is real, which is um, people in society, especially the people who are not uh, familiar with um, AI are concerned, um, and this is very reasonable. It's a new technology, it's very disruptive. And so we need to do a good job making sure that we communicate what we do and that our algorithms are uh, going to stand the, the test of um, time, and in particular that they are way better than the equivalent human-powered uh, systems. Now, <clears throat> alongside these um, what are some titles that are also positive ones? Uh, if done right, AI could make policing fairer, face recognition accuracy of forensic examiners, super recognizer, and face recognition algorithms. This is an article that shows that machines are much better than humans, and so you never want to trust, trust humans for face recognition because they make too many mistakes. Why bureaucrats don't seem to care, and so this is a, a very um, important fact, which is uh, bureaucracies powered by humans are very uncaring and cold, and maybe we can build AI systems that could take care of people a little bit better. And <clears throat> the most important of these positive articles is this one, biased algorithms are easier to fix than biased people. And so as soon as we discover um, that uh, an algorithm is biased, we can do something about it. We are engineers, we know how to fix things. Uh, so this is the somehow glimmer of hope, or more than a glimmer, <clears throat> and um, it tells us let's just do things right. And to do things right, you need to measure uh, quantities, and today um, we'll talk about measuring uh, bias. And if we can measure bias, we can probably uh, correct it. So how do you measure bias? <clears throat> and um, um, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, has a long track record on measuring the performance of um, face recognition algorithms. And recently they have started to measure bias. And here you see one of many hundreds of tables that they have in a report they published in December 2019. And what you see here is one measure of error rate, a false non match rate for different types of people divided up by gender or sex, <clears throat> female on the left, male on the right, and country of origin. And what you see is that, for example, on the left, there are some countries that have very high uh, error rates, uh, Somalia. Now, coincidentally, <clears throat> Somalia has the lowest error rate for males. And so highest for females, lowest for males, that doesn't sound too good. So do we have a strong biased, gender-based bias. And, um, and the, the picture is a little bit difficult to interpret because, for example, you take Ghana, another African country, same performance, and Ethiopia, which borders on Somalia, also same performance for females and males. So uh, is there bias? There is no bias. Are these numbers uh, meaningful? Uh, we don't know. So it's a big question, not easy to measure bias. Another example, <clears throat> is a study from 2018 based on faces that were collected from websites of six parliaments, three in Scandinavia, three in Africa, to collect faces that were light-skinned and dark-skinned. 
And here, the, um, the, the big news is that um, if you compare the error rates in gender classification, so this is not face recognition, it's gender classification, uh, it's much higher for dark-skinned females than for light-skinned females. Now, this study is very <laughs> interesting because it introduces the question of intersectional um, accounting, namely you don't want to see how well algorithms are doing purely on uh, dark-skinned people versus light-skinned people and females versus males, but you want to look at the intersection of them. And so light-skinned females versus dark-skinned females. But you see that here on this data set, <clears throat> a number of algorithms, and I'm, um, I'm going to tell you in a moment what they are, um, are having very different error rates uh, in the 5% range for light-skinned females and in the 25-30% range for dark-skinned females. So here the algorithms are three commercial algorithms that appeared in the original study in 2018, system A, B, and C, the red tones, and two that we implemented um, uh, ourselves to verify or to reproduce the experiment. And so we took a 51 uh, layer ResNet and we trained it on two different publicly available data sets, Celebay and Fairface, and those are the blue points and you see that qualitatively the results are comparable. Now, <clears throat> do we, can we deduce that these algorithms are biased against dark skinned females? Now, the, the images came from a very um, special population, which was, again, parliamentarians. And parliamentarians are fairly straight-laced. And so we don't find many um, hairstyles, for example, that are non-gender conforming. And so this was pointed out by a paper from IBM, also in 2018. And we don't find in this data set short-haired uh, light-skinned females uh, or long-haired males, but we do find quite a few short-haired um, dark-skinned females for, for whatever reason. So the, the data set is biased, and we know that gender classification algorithms uh, perform better on uh, gender-typical hairstyles. Why? Well, because they are trained on those. Uh, they are trained on celebrities and whatnot. Uh, and so we don't know here if we are measuring a bias in the test set or a bias in the algorithm. And so this is a big problem. And the problem is caused by this uh, complicated correlation between different uh, characteristics of these faces. Okay, so what do you do in this case? And there is a uh, uh, an approach, which is the experimental approach. So first of all, the type of studies we've seen so far are of the kind that is called observational. And you collect data in the wild. This is how computer vision people do it. Uh, unfortunately, if you do that, then you expose yourself to these funky correlations. In order to, to eliminate all correlations, you have to do an experiment where you hold everything else constant and you modify one characteristic at a time. And so an example is a paper by Sandhill Molinatan and Marian Bertrand, in which um, what they do is they want to measure whether people who apply for jobs in the US are discriminated against if they have a white skin or a dark skin. And the way they do it is they take a bunch of standard uh, job applications, they send them out to um, companies that uh, are advertising for jobs, but they do a subtle manipulation. For each application, they send two copies and they modify the first name of the applicant to induce the perception that the applicant is either uh, dark-skinned or light-skinned. So everything else is the same. And so this is an experiment because they modify one attribute at a time. And doing this, they proved that there is indeed uh, a problem in the job market in the US uh, and dark-skinned applicants were receiving 50% fewer invitations for an interview than light-skinned applicants. And so that was a big problem. And this paper made uh, a big difference in social sciences in studying this phenomenon. Now the question is, can we do the same for faces? And so <clears throat> the IBM paper I was referencing earlier had an idea which was, let's try to modify by using computer, uh, a signal processing, computer graphics, modify the skin tone of um, 
of faces in the data set and here you see two experiments to um, to such cases and let's see if the skin tone has any effect on the error rate of gender classification and what they found it, it is that it doesn't have any effect and so they could rule out using this method that uh, skin tone has uh, an effect on gender classification which was uh, a finding of the previous study of the observational study I showed it I showed you now the fact is uh, they could not they didn't know how to do this for any other attribute like hair length age uh, facial expression and so on and so that's a that's a question that we are asking and so how could we do it and we can benefit from <clears throat> from uh, advances in synthesis. And I don't have to explain to this crowd that thanks to guns, nowadays we can produce very uh, realistic uh, faces. Thanks especially to the group at, uh, at NVIDIA who has invested a lot of time and uh, good ideas in this. And so the, uh, the question is, okay, we can synthesize these faces, but can we carry out experiments in which we modify one attribute at a time? And so <clears throat> we have invested some time in figuring out how to control the appearance of synthetic faces. And um, uh, there is a paper that uh, came out more or less <clears throat> when we were working on this that uh, shows the first step. And so the idea is that you have a latent space from which you draw samples that you pass through the generator of the gun. And um, you may have two samples, Z1 and Z2, that give rise to a face that appears to be female and a face that appears to be male. And the idea is that um, the characteristics or attributes might be a smooth function of Z. And therefore, if you draw a line from Z1 to Z2, you might find um, a whole section where you can generate females and a whole section where you generate males. And there must be a point in the middle uh, where you have a transition. And so if you find this point, maybe you can identify a direction uh, from that point that will make a face that is ambiguous into a male or uh, into a female. <clears throat> so you can systematize this by um, sampling other, uh, or by observing other um, characteristics, other measurable attributes and <clears throat> repeat this, uh, this idea. So using <clears throat> this technique, we can generate faces that uh, are different in age while maintaining uh, the same, uh, the rest of the same attributes uh, or that have more or less facial hair above to the right or where the skin color is changing in the bottom left or where the hair length is changing in the bottom right. So uh, it takes a little bit of, um, of attention to get this, and we have a paper out on archive and another one coming out uh, here at ECCB that explain uh, in detail how we do that. And so I'm not going to review that, but I want to highlight a number of challenges that you have to tackle when you do this. Um, the dimensions that we are interested in are not orthogonal in principle. And so, for example, when you, if you look at the top, uh, line when we change the hair length of a face. Um, if you start from the right, you see a female face with long hair and you move to the left, uh, you find a face that has short hair, but it has become also male. So there are correlations that are due to <clears throat> the way that these uh, dimensions are arranged in uh, latent space. Uh, but as you might imagine, you may orthogonalize these dimensions. And so if you follow the second line of this display, you were able to maintain the um, appearance of it being a female, despite the fact that it's um, <clears throat> that the hair is uh, is uh, getting shorter. Okay, and so the same phenomenon is the two lines below. Now, for other attributes, we don't find the need to orthogonalize, and so here, for example, skin uh, color does not seem to um, to produce to, to to tangle up with other uh, significant characteristics. And so um, even if you don't orthogonalize, it's fine, but we orthogonalize everything. Now, <clears throat> okay, the third idea is that if you want to investigate <clears throat> algorithms for bias, what you want to do is you want to know if uh, the bias is due, for example, to skin color or to uh, gender or to hair length. 
And so what you want to do is to generate what is called matched samples. This is practiced in the medical community when they do clinical trials. And so um, here we have eight faces, and you can think of them as a vertex of a vertices of a three-dimensional cube, the dimensions being hair length, gender, and skin color. And so we start from the center of the cube with a neutral face, and then we move uh, towards the, the eight corners. And so here we have um, <clears throat> eight faces where we can sample all of these different attributes without changing other attributes. And so we know that since they are matched by physiognomy, physiognomy is not going to affect the measurements. If, uh, if uh, physiognomy is tilting the errors one way or another, it will do it for all the faces and not for one at a time. Okay, so these are other examples of our transects. We call them transects because they cut across the space of different attributes and the samples are matched. Okay, so I've given you the main ideas having to do with phase synthesis and the key point is being able to generate transects that experimentally change one attribute at a time while maintaining everything uh, constant. Now, how do we know what these attributes are and how do we know that the synthetic method is doing a good job? And so here we come to the fourth ingredient which is we use uh, massive human annotations to calibrate the method and to verify that the uh, system is, is working correctly. And so <clears throat> we sample from the latent space, that's the space you see indicated with Z1, Z2, Z3, and about 5,000 samples, which we annotate for eight attributes with human annotators. Um, once we have these annotations, we can uh, decide on the coordinate system that will modify one attribute at a time. This will be used to produce samples through the generator. Here you see one transect that only explores uh, hair length. And once we have generated our transects, which in our experiments had contained eight images each, we can send the transects through the classifier that we want to evaluate for uh, bias. That's the orange box at the bottom and it will generate predictions. And then we send them again to human annotators because we don't want to trust necessarily the generator to have done a good job. And so we get a ground truth from the human annotators and now we can compare human annotations and um, machine annotations and we can see if there is bias. Okay, how do we collect human annotations? And we use a system that is um, uh, offered by Amazon it's called SageMaker Ground Truth. It's built on top of uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, and um, it provides you with a lot of um, utilities beyond Amazon Mechanical Turk so that even a professor like me can, can carry out the experiments and the annotations. Here is the uh, GUI that the annotators will see for skin tone. And so on the right, you have clickable buttons uh, that indicate the six different levels of skin tone that we have uh, identified. And on the left, you find guidance on what the different tones uh, would be. Uh, this is a different interface, and this is to measure hair length. Again, on the right, top right, you find uh, five different levels of hair length. On the left, there is a clear explanation of how to interpret the levels. And so the annotators choose one and move on. And the annotators can work on this at approximately <clears throat> 20, 15, 20 annotations per minute. Here, is, here are raw scores we obtain from our annotators. The transect here is one dimensional. It goes from uh, the left is more female, the right is more male in small increments. And here we are annotating skin tone. Uh, and as you can see, there is a small correlation in this particular experiment um, between skin tone and gender. And the dark dots, the, the black dots, are individual annotators' um, judgments for each one of the images. Um, the x-axis indicates the image that we're talking about from minus six to the left to plus six to the right, zero in the center. These are 13 images. And uh, I have added a little bit of noise to the annotations to be able to see all of them. And what you see is that most annotations uh, fall within uh, 
two or three different bins. And so they're well grouped. And by taking a median or an average of the annotations, you obtain a reliable, repeatable measurement of what, uh, of what humans would say by looking at a certain picture. This is the same for hair length. And I'll let you take a look. And this is the same for gender, where again, <clears throat> you see that the ratings of the annotators are grouped. In this case, they're mostly inside, all inside the same bin. There is a lot of agreement uh, for gender. Okay, so um, once the images are synthesized, the algorithm has a certain belief on what it has done. That's what you see as intended. And humans give us a different reading. And if the two readings agree, then we proceed with using the image for our experiments. If the humans and the uh, algorithm, the intended um, uh, gender or hair or skin color or whatever, disagree, then we discard those images. So only when there is agreement, we use the uh, images. And here you see examples of images rated by hair length, the shortest on the left, longest on the right. Here you see images rated by gender and so on. And we only use um, images where uh, these um, attributes are unambiguously rated. And so we discard the, the slices in the middle. We only take, um, you, we only take unambiguous uh, ratings. Here is for skin tone. And we also annotate the degree of fakeness. So some images, as you know, even if they are produced by current uh, guns, uh, may appear to be uh, slightly fake. And so we also discard those ones. And those are on the right-hand side of the panel. And the ones that are, have low fakeness rating on the left are the ones we use for the experiments. OK, so all in all, we have 8,000 um, synthetic images in our transects, and we end up using about 6,000. So we discard about a quarter due to the different criteria that I was showing to you. Um, and so what comes out? And so the first important thing to, um, uh, eval to evaluate is whether using synthetic methods, we can achieve the different characteristics that we want to achieve. And so here, for example, if you look at uh, skin color, um, the top two lines, Celeb A and FFHQ, you see that um, they are very skewed towards uh, light-skinned individuals. So they're not very good for evaluating uh, bias because there are very few dark-skinned individuals in these data sets. While <clears throat> PPB, which is the data set of parliamentarians by design is balanced between light and dark skin, Scandinavia versus Africa. And our transects are also balanced and you see it in the violin plots. It's a third column. Okay, so we can achieve uh, a distribution of, um, of attributes as we, uh, as we need. Now, what happens here is uh, what we see is that uh, <clears throat> the PPB data set, which you see on the bottom left, the one made of the parliamentarians, has the uh, skew that I was talking about before. Uh, so males are only uh, there with very short hair. Um, for females, the hair is typically long. However, for dark-skinned females, and that's the dark violin plot that looks um, longest on the left, um, so bottom left again, uh, you see that uh, for dark-skinned females, there is a fairly even distribution between short hair and long hair. And so this causes the bias in the data set I was talking about. Uh, in the synthetic images we generate, you see that for both females and males, dark-skinned and light-skinned individuals have roughly the same distribution of hair lengths. And so the, um, this compensates for uh, the bias. So that's, at least there is no uh, hair bias and you can measure um, the effects of skin color and gender uh, independently. So what do we find? And <clears throat> on the top, you see the measurements with the PPB data set divided out for um, females, males, short hair, dark hair, light skin, dark skin. And so I suppose that when you want to, uh, so you can look, uh, if, you, if you need to look at these plots for longer, you will uh, find them in our archive plot or you can just freeze the, the talk to look at them carefully. 
so what you see on top is that some, uh, some groups like males with long hair are very much underrepresented and so the error bars or the confidence intervals are extremely long. Uh, basically you can say nothing about those groups and the same is females with light skin and short hair at the very left of the top plot. For the transects, which are our synthetic images, since we can generate as many as we want, we can achieve um, high numbers for each group and we can keep the confidence intervals small. And what you see, if you look at this, you see that um, if you compare uh, short-haired um, females, um, for example, you see that um, the, they are the leftmost ones, the error rate for white is higher than the error rate for dark-skinned. And so it looks like um, the error rates are reversed with respect in this experimental study with respect to the observational study above. So what it tells us, yes, there is a bias, but the bias is, if you will, a little bit in favor of light skin or you know, against light skin. Uh, and also you see that indeed short haired females have higher error rates than long haired uh, females. And um, this is um, uh, better uh, visible here, where you see that um, um, there is no bias any longer against dark skinned females if you compare them to light skinned females. However, there is a small effect, a small bias against females in general, regardless of, uh, of skin. Now, since we can synthesize the faces, <clears throat> we can explore the effects of other attributes. Um, so while the PPB data set is purely limited to middle aged people, here we can also explore the effects on very young people and uh, old people. And what you see is that there are huge errors for males in the child and teen categories. And so uh, whatever differences you find in middle age, they are eclipsed by the differences you find in, um, in the younger population. And so that's clearly a weakness for gender classification. And it's not surprising because um, babies are very difficult to tell apart males versus uh, females. And on top of that, the training sets don't contain many young people. You can also spend some time looking at uh, regressions to identify <clears throat> which characteristics have maximum effect on bias. And for example, if you have a beard or don't have a beard, that causes a big bias in the error rates. And in the, as soon as you have a beard, algorithms decide that you're a male. And so uh, bearded people or non-bearded people are highly, there is a high bias in that dimension. And then you can follow with your eye what other biases there might be. Okay, so I will, uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip the errors. You can see them at a glance. Okay, so let me tell you that um, males misclassified as females are typically very young, as we were saying bef seeing before, and you see them at the top. Uh, and the pattern is let, less obvious for females because the error rates are more distributed across, uh, across um, races uh, and uh, ages. <clears throat> okay, before I conclude, this is the second to last slide. <clears throat> there are interesting uh, things that are left out by the study. Uh, some correlations uh, we didn't pay attention to and we discovered only after completing our, our um, paper, uh, but they're interesting. And so uh, here you see one, when you make uh, men's hair longer, they tend to sprout a beard. And you see that in the top uh, two pairs. And so definitely this is something that we need to annotate and orthogonalize for. Uh, so it's uh, disappointing. And so in fact, we noticed that uh, long haired men, which we thought would have more error rate than short-haired men, in fact, they have more or less the same or even lower. And we realize now it's because they're sprouting a beard, which is a dead giveaway for being a male. Um, in the bottom line, <clears throat> what you see is that um, when you make male faces into female faces, they tend to sprout earrings. This is not true always here. It's, these are cherry-picked examples, but we've seen it. Uh, and so again, this is an interesting case because you have to decide a priori whether uh, earrings are part of your gender definition or not. 
If you believe that earrings are part of a gender definition, then the algorithm is fine. If you think that earrings are not part of gender definition, then you've got to orthogonalize away uh, earrings. And so you have to have your annotators annotate for these characteristics and then correct for that. Okay, so I would like to conclude here. I told you about the difference between observational studies, which is what we do in computer vision, uh, and experimental studies, which is what people do in medicine. And needless to say, uh, by now you must be convinced that observational studies are a big problem because too many variables are correlated and therefore it's very difficult to draw any firm conclusions on bias with obs observational studies. And so we've got to move towards experimental uh, methods. Uh, <clears throat> I told you about intersectionality, which means dividing up your data set into intersectional classes that are the combination of a number defined by the combination of a number of attributes. And the fact that if you uh, look at observational studies, there is a huge sampling bias. And so some of these intersectional um, classes, for example, uh, females with light skin and short hair are vastly undersampled. And so you cannot study bias because of this undersampling or oversampling of different groups. I showed you how synthetic uh, faces can be used for constructing uh, an experimental method and how you need to couple the ability to synthesize faces with massive human annotations to be able to carry out uh, an experimental study. And so um, uh, the fourth line I've just said it to you, um, it's uh, a first idea of an experimental method for measuring bias in computer vision. We don't think we have uh, exhausted all the, <clears throat> all the questions that there are, but we hope to have motivated people to look into this. And at the bottom of the slide, you find a link to our archive paper. Okay, so it was great to, uh, to talk to you and um, I hope uh, to see you at, in person at some, uh, at some conference in the future.